And so, for example, we've heard Mr. Ayers talk a little bit about social justice, dividing the pie, getting people's fair share. Never seemed to occur to him, how do you get a pie? Who made the pie? How do you make a pie grow? It's very easy to pull out the carving knife and start splitting. It's much more difficult to actually be the one who comes in with the pie. Now, I want to talk a little bit about America in the, in the broadest scheme of things to look at what America has meant in the world. If you think about human history, there are very few great inventions in history, truly great inventions. The invention of the wheel, the invention of fire, I think America is responsible, responsible for perhaps the greatest invention of all, the invention of wealth creation. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that for centuries and even millennia, nobody knew how to create stuff. Nobody knew how to create wealth. I remember as a kid, uh, I would go to school and I'd have 10 marbles. And I'd look at the other kids, and they had more marble, marbles than I did. And I said to myself, how do I go from having 10 marbles to having 12 marbles? And I realized there was no way. None of us had any money. We had marbles. The only way for me to go from 12, 10 marbles to 12 marbles was to take some other guy's two marbles. Historically, wealth was acquired through theft, through acquisition, and through conquest. How did countries get founded? Machiavelli says all great nations are founded in crime. You found a country by invading some other guy's country, killing the man who's running it, and declaring yourself to be the king. And that is how wealth was obtained for thousands of years. But the very idea that you can start with 10 marbles and end up with 15 marbles without stealing somebody else's marbles, that's the American idea. That is a very a bold idea that you can, in a sense, create something out of nothing. It's virtually divine. Now, the reason that this went unnoticed for centuries is that the people who create wealth, who are basically the science and technology guy on the one hand and the entrepreneur or the merchant on the other, these two guys have been hated in virtually all cultures throughout human history. The merchant, the trader, the entrepreneur is a low man on the totem pole. If you look at, for example, Confucius, he says that the, the noble man knows what is virtuous. The low man knows what is profitable. In India, we have the caste system. Who's at the top? The Brahmin, the priest. And next, it's the, the royalty, the, uh, the Kshatriyas, and then down the list you go until one step from the bottom, the hated untouchable, and right above him, the merchant, the trader. Low life scum. The great Muslim thinker Ibn Khaldun in the Middle Ages says that looting is a better way, a more moral way to get wealth than trade. Why? Because he said trade is kind of effeminate. You're essentially uh, slightly exploiting the wants of other people. He says looting is very manly. Because in looting, you have to beat a guy in open combat and take his stuff. So it appeals to the manly virtue of courage. I say all this because I wanted to convey, and by the way, this is true even today. I mean, even if you go to Europe, even now, inherited money is better than earned money. Why? Because inherited money is like manna from heaven, kind of the way Villiers got money. Earned money means from the European point of view, you probably had to run over some guys to get it. So it's looked down upon. Here's what I want to say. You have this totem pole with, if you will, the priest at the top, the merchant at the bottom. What America did, what the founders did, is they flipped it. They created a society that would be devoted to wealth creation through trade and technology and entrepreneurial capitalism. This was Always an American idea, but it was always intended to be for the benefit of everybody. The Declaration of Independence does not say all Americans are created equal. It says all men. And so the American recipe was from the beginning intended to be made in America, but intended for global export. Everybody 
could benefit from this system. If you look at the original Constitution, by the way, before the Bill of Rights was added later, it only talks about one right. The right to patents and copyrights. Technology, invention, is the key to American success and American affluence. Now, what is the benefit of this? The benefit of this is absolutely stunning. When I first came to America, the most impressive thing to me was not that there was affluence in America. I already knew that. The most impressive thing to me was that the ordinary guy, and I'm not just talking about the smart guy, I'm talking about the, the not so smart guy. I'm not talking about the hard working guy, I'm talking about the guy who didn't work that hard. What the greatness of America was that the not so smart, not so hard working guy still had an amazingly good life. He had a nice home, he had two cars in the backyard, if he lived in California he had a small pool, uh, and I'm like, wow. I'm constantly comparing America with my friends in India. They have one guy who's been trying to emigrate to America now for I don't know how many years. The poor guy can never seem to get a visa. So finally I said to him, I said, why are you so eager to come to America? He goes, Dinesh, I just want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. <laughs> now, what's he getting at? What he's getting at is the phenomenon, if you will, of mass prosperity. Of the ordinary guy having it fantastically well. And that's true. But I want to go beyond that to suggest that what America really offers is not just comfort and wealth and the ability to live well. It offers you the chance to write the script of your own life. Not long ago I asked myself, how has my life changed by coming to the United States? How it would be different if had I stayed, say, in India? Now, I grew up in a middle class family, and I didn't have great luxury, but neither did I lack for anything. In coming to America, my life is it better off materially, yes, but it's not a radical difference. Actually, my life has changed more in other ways. Had I stayed in India, chances are I would have probably lived in a five or ten mile radius of where I was born. Would have married a girl of my identical socioeconomic and caste and cultural background. I would have become an engineer like my dad, or a doctor like one of my uncles. I would have had a whole set of opinions on a bunch of subjects that could be predicted in advance. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is my destiny would to a large degree have been given to me. Not that I would have no choice, but the choice is within a confined parameter. The beauty of America is that in this country we have the ability to write the script of our own life. We are in a sense in the driving seat of our own future. And our biggest decisions in life are made by us. America creates this sense of possibility and out of that you can become an activist, a community organizer. In a sense, what are you doing? You are living off the great capitalist explosion of wealth that you didn't even create. And who's doing that? Most of you. If you look at your life, you're actually living out the dream of the early Karl Marx. The early Karl Marx said it would be great to live in a society where there was not a whole lot of work to be done. In which we can sit around, maybe do a little bit of work in the morning, and then we could do some art in the afternoon and some intellectual banter in the evening and then some artistic expression and in a way he was describing Dartmouth. <laughs> but what he kind of missed is how do you sort of get a Dartmouth? Who pays for it? Where does all this abundance come from? There's nothing like Dartmouth virtually anywhere else in the world. All the foreign students from everywhere want to come to places like this one. Why? Because they actually represent a fulfillment, not just of the right-wing, if you will, capitalist dream, but of the left-wing, progressive dream of self-fulfillment and personal realization. Now, I want to turn for a moment, without losing sight, of what is happening to the American dream. What is happening to the American dream, I fear, is it is beginning to be shrunken in America and incredibly it is beginning to be seized upon elsewhere in the world. We are losing our own dream. It's going to other people. 
And if you look around the world, what you see is countries like Brazil, China, India, Russia coming up. They're growing at five times the rate of the United States. Why? We have taught them the secret of wealth creation. For a long time, we sort of tried the Bill Ayers formula. We tried to go over there and build homes. We tried to go over there and do stuff for them. We tried to go over there and lend them money, the IMF loans, all of which were a complete waste of time and money. Well, meaning, and admittedly for the moral edification of the people doing it, but of no real value to the people on the ground. Finally, the Indians and the Chinese had an insight, and it could be called very crudely the advantage of backwardness. What's the advantage of backwardness? We don't have a whole bunch of money, but we do have a whole bunch of people. And if we can get those people, not to sit around doing nothing, talking to anthropologists or social workers, but making stuff that other people actually want to buy, we will in fact take over the world market. And that's really what's happened. The American dream, our dream, has now become a global dream. This is the great gift that America has given and is giving to the world. It has actually been globalization. I'm talking about global technological capitalism has been far and away the greatest anti-poverty program ever created. All the concoctions of Jane Addams and frankly Mother Teresa and every government handout and Barack Obama pale next to the simple ingenuity of the iPhone in a small Indian village where some uh, female entrepreneur is using it to sell a bicycle. In other words, what has delivered the goods for people is not ultimately social agitation. Rather, it is the very American sense of taking nothing, sand, and making it into silicon. It is that ingenuity, the making of the pie, that's far more profound an act than simply saying, what do I do to divide the pie? Everybody has an opinion on that.